My grandkids, Maverick and Evie, love to play hide and seek. Hide and speak, seek is supposed to go like this. I cover my eyes and count to 20. Will you hide? Then you stay hidden until I find you. Pretty simple. The little kids turn the game completely upside down. When I play with Maverick and Evie, I count to 20 and then say, ready or not, here I come. And immediately I hear giggles. <laughs> I walk around and say, where's Maverick? Is he under the chair? Where is Evie? Is she behind the door? I can't find them anywhere. Then one of them will pop their head out from behind a curtain and say, look back here. <laughs> I find them every time, they laugh, then we play again, and they hide in the exact same place. <laughs> when it comes to hide and seek, Maverick and Evie and children everywhere turn the rules upside down. For them, the game is not about winning, it's about the experience and the joy of being found. Do you remember this saying, it's not whether you win or lose, but how you play the game? <laughs> Heard that one lately? Now it's do whatever it takes, win at all costs. You don't just beat the other team, you gotta be better than your teammates. At all, above all else, win. And I worry about the long-term effects on our kids. If winning is everything, how are they gonna handle life's inevitable losses? How will they handle disappointment and defeat? How are they gonna represent Jesus if everyone around them is seen as competition that they have to one up? Somehow we have to take our thinking and turn it upside down. Jesus was an incredible teacher. One of his favorite things to do is turn, turn conventional thinking upside down. Jesus taught that in the kingdom of God, under was over, first was last, last was first, higher was lower, and lower was higher. If you want to get up, you have to go down. If you want to have much, you have to give what you have away. If you want to be honored, you must first serve. It was incredibly confusing for the religious experts of the day. They had a carefully scripted religion with a well-ordered set of rules. Jesus came and turned it upside down. And still today, over 2,000 years later, much of what Jesus taught goes against basic human instinct, our nature. That's the kind of passage we look at today in Luke chapter 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. The Pharisees were the religious rulers and the experts in the law of Moses, and they believed if you followed that set of rules, you'd be okay with God, even though rule following rarely results in true transformation. They were looking for a reason to have Jesus killed because he was violating the rules. On this occasion, he was in the home of a prominent Pharisee, and in the middle of all the experts, was a man with dropsy. Dropsy was a massive swelling of joints and tissues anywhere blood can reside. Remember in those days, disease was seen as the result of sin. This guy was not the typical banquet guest. We're not really sure why he was there. I think it was a setup. It was the Sabbath. According to the law, you weren't supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. The Pharisees would consider healing someone work, and they were watching to see what Jesus would do. Taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Swelling went away, body returned to normal. Right there in front of everyone, the man was healed by Jesus. Then Jesus turned to the Pharisee and said, if any of you has a sign or, or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, Will you not immediately pull him out? They had nothing to say. There was some tension in the room. The Pharisees saw the man as worthless. Jesus healed him and saw him as incredibly valuable. The Pharisees didn't know what to do. Picture Jesus standing in the middle of the quiet room. He had the attention of everyone. It was an obviously a chance to teach. And you'd think Jesus would teach about healing, 
or about the system of rules that devalues people with disease and disability. But Jesus went an entirely different direction. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, which was familiar in their culture, your rank, position, wealth, or power determined your spot. When there was a banquet or a feast, the more important you were, the closer you sat to the host of the banquet. And the best seats were right down front, kind of opposite of the way you think in church. The further you were from the host, the less important you were. If you were at the kids' table, you were an absolute nobody. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, don't take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come say, hey, give this guy your seat. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place so when the host comes, they'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all your guests. Jesus said, don't put yourself in the position of honor. Put yourself in the low place. Then the host can move you to a better place if he wants to. And then Jesus finished this short story with a paradox. A paradox is the statement that seems contradictory at first, but upon closer examination reveals a deep truth. Here's a few examples. Youth is wasted on the young. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. This is the beginning of the end. The more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. The more you're afraid to fail, the more likely you are to fail. The only constant in life is change. Here was Jesus' lesson expressed in a paradox, an upside-down statement. Jesus said, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. On the surface, that didn't seem to make sense. In our culture today, it really doesn't make sense. You don't get exalted by humbling yourself. You get exalted by climbing the top, by looking out for yourself, by making sure everyone knows what you've done and what you've accomplished and how important you are. Everyone wants to be great. Not a lot of people lining up to be humble. Dictionary definition of humble is low in rank, quality, or station, unpretentious, lowly. Dictionary definition of exalt is to raise in rank, character, or status, to elevate. Jesus said, Everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Everyone who intentionally makes himself low will rise in status. There are a lot of things in our world that can humble you. People can humble you. Easter Sunday morning this year, I told everyone, before you sit down, turn around and show off your Easter duds. You look good. And during video announcements, I walked back and Lucas and Mary Grace said, what are duds? That must be something from the 80s. <laughs> they called me old on Easter in the middle of the service. <laughs> People can humble you. Circumstances can humble you. A few years ago, I was in Scotland. I was a guest at an event. So they, they put me in a hotel. Hotel room was fine. But it didn't have a shower. Just had a tub with one of those, you know, those shower nozzle things. But then it didn't have a shower curtain or anything. So when I, when I tried to shower, I got water all over the, the bathroom. I didn't want to complain because I was a guest. So I didn't say anything. No one else seemed to mention it. A few days later, when it was time to check out of the hotel, I was going through the room to make sure I didn't leave anything. I closed the bathroom door and there behind it was a shower That's pretty humbling. Another time I was preaching spiritual emphasis week at the headquarters of the Assemblies of God for all their team and employees. And one night, the important leaders invited me to dinner. I was trying to be cool and collected, uh, but they didn't start us with water and I was thirsty. And I noticed a pitcher on the table with water and cucumbers in it. Now, I hate cucumbers. I think they're naked pickles. 
And, and you already know my opinion. I think the road to hell is paved with pickles. Um, but I saw this pitcher. I assumed it was for drinking. So I poured myself a glass. Took a big gulp. It's horrible. And now I'm stuck with this water. I'm trying to get rid of it. When the waiter comes to give everyone else water, he sees already you have some. And so finally I asked for sparkling water and I didn't drink any more of the centerpiece. <laughs> Been there about five days. Stale cucumber water. I have lots of stories about me doing stupid things. Happens all the time. No amens necessary there. I do all kinds of dumb stuff. Circumstances can humble you. God can humble you. When you think of being humble, do you think of things like pride goes before a fall? You've been taught that if you get too full of yourself, God will humble you. And it's true, he will. God will humble you or people will. But in this case, that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus didn't say, wait around a while, keep doing your thing, and one day your heavenly father will humble you. Jesus didn't say, be careful, because if you think you're all that in a bag of chips, you'll ultimately fail and be humbled. Jesus didn't say, don't get too full of yourself. Well, someone will come along, make you look foolish. You'll be humbled. Jesus said, humble yourself. You do it. Don't wait for God's circumstances or someone else. Actively look for ways to humble yourself and make yourself lower. Now, in case you're not quite sure I'm interpreting that right, let me share another verse with you, 1 Peter 5, 5. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So you get to choose whether God opposes you or gives you grace. Pretty easy choice, huh? I'll take the grace. The key is to humble yourself instead of exalting yourself. There's plenty that keeps you humble. Social media is filled with jerks whose only goal is to tear you down. That's humbling. Your teenage daughter who refuses to ride in the front seat with you because you're not cool keeps you humble. This week, three middle school girls wanted to ride with me in my truck to the evening, our camp. I thought, this is awesome. They want to ride with their pastor. All three of them sat in back. They didn't want to ride with their pastor. They wanted a chauffeur. That was humbling. The person at work who cuts down everything you do and makes fun of you, keeps you humble. If you're in leadership or in ministry, it seems like everything you do attracts criticism. Criticism keep you humble, right? Some people even think their, their ministry assignment is to keep you humble. Which, by the way, fault finding is not a spiritual gift. All that may be humbling. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus said, humble yourself. Actively look for ways you can be humble. Even though Jesus told that story, the disciples still struggled. In Mark 10, James and John approached Jesus with a request. They wanted to have the best seats in heaven. One of them to sit on Jesus' is right, the other one on the left. They were arguing about their chair in heaven. And as you can imagine, the other disciples didn't like that much. The Bible says they were indignant. Jesus watched his 12 handpicked followers argue over their seats, and Jesus answered, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For the Son of Man, that's what Jesus called himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. So how do you humble yourself? I'll give you three ways. Number one, become a servant. I was a junior in high school, or junior in Bible school, and I knew I was ready to leave because, I mean, I had all that education and knowledge. I went to my pastor, Jadon George, 
He offered me my first job in ministry. I expected maybe be the youth pastor, maybe the Sunday night preacher, because it's a big church, a couple thousand people. So I didn't expect the pulpit on Sunday mornings yet. I knew that would wait a couple months. <laughs> but I knew it would be a high position of leadership. I sat down across from his desk and he said, Rod, if you want to lead, you first have to serve. You're going to be my administrative assistant. Doesn't that sound like a great title? I made copies of tapes, which were they're little things about this size. They were after records before CDs and MP3s and everything else. I made copies of tapes. I picked up his dry cleaning. I washed his cars. I ran errands. I made airport runs, over 100. I did grunt work for the princely sum of $25 a week, about 50 cents an hour. After six months, I was sick of it. I went to him, I said, any idiot could do this job. I'm ready for more. And do you know what my wise mentor said? Great, then you'll do this six more months. It was a powerful principle I always remember and apply. If you want to lead, you have to serve. The natural tendency is to skip this step. It just doesn't seem as much fun. You say, well, I want to be a leader. I want to be a teacher. I want to speak. Jesus said, great, find a place to be a servant. Find a place where you don't get any glory, where you don't receive great awards or honor. Every once in a while, do the job no one else is willing to do. Stay after an event and put up chairs, put up tables. You know, every week for the last six weeks, when this service is over, there's a group of people who stay and who stack all the chairs and go get chair carts and take them out of this room and line them up in a hallway and so that the work can start. There's uh, other people who drape everything in plastic, the whole balcony, all the TVs, everything on this stage. No one notices them. No one claps for them. They're just serving. You can change a diaper. You can drive a shuttle. You can pick up trash. You can work in prison ministry. Talk to Pastor Lane. We've, more and more prisons are opening their doors to us. Sit with the people no one else wants to sit with. Develop friendships with people who aren't cool and who don't do anything to help you get likes on your social media feed and do all those things and don't document any of it. Lots of people want to stand in front of a crowd. Jesus said, if you want to be a leader, serve. And the disciples still didn't get it. Luke 22 tells the story of the Last Supper. Jesus is last night with his disciples. It had to be emotional. Jesus served them what we now refer to as communion. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who's going to betray me is with me at this table. The son of man will go as it's been decreed. Woe to the man who betrays him. They begin to question among themselves, which of them might do this? Jesus just said, one of you is going to betray me. He just told them he's going to be arrested and crucified. And the disciples begin to question each other to figure out the traitor. But then Jesus' last night, they got distracted and a dispute arose among them as to which was considered the greatest. Jesus was about to be betrayed, arrested, and killed. Instead of caring for him or trying to protect him, the disciples, in all their love and concern, began arguing about who was Jesus' favorite and who deserved the title, the ultimate disciple. Okay, guys, so the big man is leaving soon, and he needs us to figure out who's taking charge. In my totally unbiased opinion, I think it should be me, because I'm obviously his favorite. After all, he called me the rock. <laughs> what, are you for real? John and I were on the Mount of Transfiguration yeah. too, and I think we might be the front runners to take this thing over. The Sons of Thunder? 
<clears throat> made to lead. Peter gets one nickname, and he thinks he's the man. Uh, literally, I think they meant dumb as a rock, right? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys. Really? I am the one that left the highest paid position to follow Jesus. I mean, after all, he did say, follow me. And that commitment, I mean, it should be honored. Commitment? Is this guy for real? Shut up, Matthew. You're nothing but a tax collector. I bet you've been stealing from us this whole time. If anybody will betray Jesus, I bet it's you. If anyone deserves to lead after Jesus, it's me. I was the first one to follow him, so I should be the first one next to him. He does have a point. I can't lie. He was the first one to follow. Bro, whose side are you on? Jesus, I'm sorry for how they're all acting. Obviously, none of them are fit to be with you. You should take me instead. What? I actually think I've got a really good shot here. My mom has always told me that I'm a naturally born leader. <laughs> I can't believe he actually said that. <laughs> Thomas, you don't know what you're talking about. You're nothing more than a pessimist. You've been a downer this whole time, right? Thank you. And the rest of you, you're just a big old crew of misfits and outcasts. Let's be real. I deserve to be the one that takes over because I'm Jesus's favorite, obviously. So, uh, sit down, shut up, and know your place. <laughs> Jesus interrupted the argument and said, verse 26, you're not to be like that. The greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. And again, Jesus made it clear, the path to being the greatest is to be the least, not to lead, but to serve, to humble yourselves. Second, put others first. If you wanna grow your leadership, grow the leadership of people around you. God honors you when you give honor away. That goes against human nature. When you have success or victory, the first thing you wanna do is claim credit. If you're failing, your first instinct is to find someone to blame. We aren't accustomed to giving honor away, only blame. But Jesus taught, find someone else to honor. Do you know why this is so difficult? We have a couple basic fears. Fear number one, if I give others honor, I will never receive my fair share. This is scarcity thinking. There's only so much to go around. I keep... M&M's in the refrigerator in my office. Kids come by, get a little cups, and I fill it up and give them a healthy breakfast or a healthy snack. And uh, every once in a while, I'll say, can I have one? And usually they'll be like, yeah. Every great once in a while, one will say, no, they're mine. I'll say, really? What they don't understand is, I could make it rain M&M's. I have an unlimited supply of M&Ms. No matter how much they take, there will always be more. The Lord has an unlimited supply. Second fear, if I elevate others, people won't recognize my leadership or efforts, which is the exact opposite. Everybody knows if there's a strong team, somewhere there's a strong leader. Number three, if I elevate others, they may get the recognition or rewards that I deserve. Again, scarcity thinking. If I help them advance, I won't. Number four, if I don't make sure everyone knows about my accomplishments, no one else will. The thinking is, I need to let people know what a good leader I am. They need to know that was my idea. You have to decide, are you living for position on earth or for kingdom advancement? Number five, my time will never come. I keep giving away honor, when am I going to get some? Listen to this verse, 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Humble yourself and trust that he will take care of you. I have a friend in California who's a retired minister. 
And every day he shares a thought by email. I keep this one on my desktop. And I read it often. I want to read it to you. The praises of men, don't take them personally. Remember, you have nothing to give except what God has given you. So pass the praise to God. Not only that, but often the praises of men are directed towards the position you hold, not you personally. For example, a pastor receives the praises of men, but in reality, it has more to do with his position than him. If you occupy a place of leadership, you may receive praise, but remember, it's because of your position. When you're no longer the leader, the praises will go to your successor. So don't become inflated with pride when praise comes your way. It's the blessing of the Lord in your life. Rejoice and let praise be directed to him. To humble yourself, number three, give God the glory. When I'm tempted to think I'm special, I remember who I am and where I came from. I was a shy, introverted misfit who was made fun of and got sick if I had to talk in front of 15 kids in class. If you lined up everyone in my class and said, who's gonna be the one who speaks to thousands, I would have been dead last right behind the pencil sharpener. They didn't imagine this, neither did I. Occasionally people will say, oh, Pastor Rod, I admire your natural gift for speaking. I stop them right there and I say, this is not a natural gift. It's a gift from God and the grace of God and a lot of work. I'm humbled that he chooses to use me. Paul said it this way. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. God chose the foolish things of the world. That's us, to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world, you and me, to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, that's me, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you're in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. If you're going to brag on Jesus, if you're going to brag, brag on Jesus and give God the glory. Here's my question. What would it look like? What would a church look like where everyone took this command of Jesus and, and put it in action, took it to heart? How would that affect how you treat your server at the restaurant in a few minutes? How would that affect where you park, where you sit in church? What difference might that make at school or at work or in your family? If, if we all really lived to put others first and humble ourselves, what could happen? See, we know how to say the right thing. Well, it's all because of Jesus. What if we really believed that? And what if we really lived it? that it's not us who deserve the credit and honor, but it's him who deserves the glory and the praise.